Friday, April 11th, 1986. A two-man team of Army veterans turned professional bank robbers hit a series of banks and armored trucks within the city limits of Miami. The robbers were well-equipped, well-trained, and equally violent, ruthlessly shooting down anyone who even hesitated to comply with their demands, prompting a small group of field agents within the FBI to execute a guerrilla-style investigation. And after a months-long game of cat and mouse, the FBI and bank robbers would intersect by chance in a quiet suburban neighborhood, setting the stage of one of the most hellish gunfights in American history. This is that story. In 1985, violence in Miami became endemic, from bank robberies to homicides to the drug trade. And while the country as a whole waged the war on drugs, Miami had its own war on drugs, overseen by the president himself. And between the drugs and the uptick in robberies, the FBI stepped in. And there are few as notorious as the C-1 Miami bank robbery squad. Consisting of 15 special agents, the units tasked with one thing and one thing only, catching bank robbers. And for the first time in its history, the C-1 squad encountered an unknown category, a crew of two armed individuals seemingly operating without subset or gang allegiance. And out of the Colombians and the various street gangs committing hundreds of armed robberies, it was somehow a crew of two guys who rattled the FBI to its core. Michael Platt and William Maddox both met as military police officers while serving in the United States Army. Platt, a former infantryman, and Maddox, a Marine who later re-enlisted in the Army, were both highly capable combat veterans. And the two became inseparable until Maddox eventually got out of the service and settled down with his wife in Columbus, Ohio. Meanwhile, Platt left the Army and started his own landscaping business down in Florida. The two would frequently chat, and it became clear that Maddox longed to live near his best friend in Florida, but it was nothing more than a pipe dream and a far cry from a stagnant and predictable life in Ohio. But around this time, on December 30th of 1983, conveniently Maddox's wife was horrifically murdered along with her coworker. Maddox was a suspect in the case, but no proof could be brought against him. He collected a $350,000 life insurance policy and reunited with Platt in Miami. And at almost a year to the day of Maddox's wife's murder, Platt's wife allegedly took her life, leaving Platt with three young children. And although suspicion would tell you they deliberately sought freedom, whether financial or psychological, the two still elected to settle once again as both men remarried and lived the quiet suburban life. But by night, they were robbing drug dealers. The media would have us believe that they were two suburban family men turned bank robbers. But it's very obvious they were two bank robbers disguised as family men. On October 9th of 1985, an armored truck made a scheduled drop at a steak and ale restaurant off of South Dixie Highway. Platt and Maddox rounded up the courier while armed with an M16 and revolver. The driver refused to get out and drove away following company policy. Platt and Maddox opened fire, striking the vehicle 15 times before deploying a smoke grenade and fleeing the scene altogether. They made out with a mere score of $2,800. Metro-Dade County Police and the FBI responded to the scene. In charge, FBI Violent Crimes Unit Supervisor, Special Agent Gordon McNeil. 
Many of the witnesses stated that the robbers looked like true professionals, from the way they spoke, to the way they moved, and carried their weapons, leaving the FBI to suspect the culprits to be either police officers or ex-military. And due to their overall failure of the heist, the FBI predicted they would strike again. And only one week later, they were right. On October 16th, Platt and Maddox hit a Wells Fargo truck fronting a Winn-Dixie in South Miami. Unlike other companies, Wells Fargo ran a three-man crew on all armored vehicles due to the volume of robberies in the area. The third guard, otherwise known as the lookout guard, posted up against a wall outside of the store, but he wasn't unaccounted for. Platt and Maddox snuck up on him and opened fire, striking the man in the leg with a 12-gauge shotgun. The other two guards returned fire and a gunfight erupted in the busy grocery store parking lot. Platt and Maddox took off without a single penny, failing yet again. And for the sake of time, dead set on securing a score, they set out to do it all over again the very next day. On October 17th, Platt and Maddox stuck up a Loomis truck outside of a Dalt's restaurant in South Miami, but the guard opened fire, prompting the men yet again to retreat. And although their first attempts were unsuccessful, the FBI took notice, as so far every heist involved gunfire. On November 8th, Platt and Maddox quit the armored trucks and decided to step up their game and overtook a Florida National Bank, making off with a clean take of $41,000. Two months later on January 10th of 1986, Platt and Maddox hit a Brinks truck outside of a Barnett Bank off South Dixie Highway. As the guard opened the door, one of them shot the guard in the back. After the guard fell, the other one shot the guard twice in the back. They cleaned out the truck and fled the scene with a take of $54,000. As Platt and Maddox made their getaway, a nearby witness followed them and reported that the robbers switched out of a 1977 gold Monte Carlo and jumped in a white Ford pickup. The 77 Monte Carlo belonged to an Emilio Briel, who was reported missing on October 4th. And for the first time in the investigation, the FBI had two real leads. Emilio Briel's stolen car and the suspect's last known vehicle, the white Ford pickup. Special Agent McNeil and his team decided to cast out a large net to patrol and take down every license plate number of every white Ford pickup in the area of South Dixie Highway between 88th and 185th Street. While Platt and Maddox were living large, the FBI, still awaiting results from the DMV, decided to make their own luck. Special Agent Ben Grogan conferred with Special Agent Ed Morellas, proclaiming that he found the suspect's next getaway vehicle. After handing Agent Morellas a copy of the Florida Herald, which covered a story about a man who was shot and carjacked by two men in the Everglades. But miraculously, the victim survived. Special Agent Grogan arrived at Jackson Memorial Hospital and conducted an interview with the now stable victim, Jose Colazzo. Colazzo stated that he was carjacked by two white males while target shooting. He reported that the men shot him multiple times before one of them fled in a white pickup. And the other in Colazzo's 1979 Black Monte Carlo, bearing Florida license plate NTJ-891. Colazzo warned him that the men were cold-blooded and ruthless. The FBI was eager to act on this new information. However, Platt and Maddox struck again, hitting the same Barnett bank and making off with $8,300 before fleeing in a black Monte Carlo. The game of chess was coming to its end. But unfortunately in life, not every game has a winner, and not every game has a loser. Not every player plays to win.
six nine twenty a.m. Southwest frequency. After FBI agents fought a fierce battle for their lives in broad daylight, the curious still crowd into this Kindle community on Southwest 82nd Avenue and 122nd Street, who lay dead in the street yesterday, responsible for the wild shootout that left two agents dead and another five wounded. Still, it's not the only South Dade neighborhood dealing with shock today. Friends of William Maddox can't believe it was their neighbor taking pictures and asking questions alongside agents trying to reconstruct the shootout. When agents and three FBI vehicles succeeded in boxing in and stopping the black Monte Carlo, all of them crashed. Platt and Maddox immediately jumped out and opened fire as the agents scrambled. Special Agent Gordon McNeil quickly recovered his 357 Magnum that he lost during the initial collision and sidelined Maddox with three rounds to the torso until McNeil was struck in the neck, falling paralyzed to the ground. Special Agent Richard Manowski was unable to recover his revolver in the wreckage and was struck in the head and the back by Platt. Special Agents Dove and Grogan were both killed at which point Platt entered Grogan's vehicle on the attack, opening fire on Agent Morales. Special Agent Gilbert Oranita returned fire with his 38 Special and was wounded by shrapnel and debris from a near miss of Platt's 223. Special Agent John Hanlon fired five rounds from his 38 Special until he was shot in the hand and groin. Agent Morales was shot in the left arm but continued to return fire with his 12-gauge shotgun, one hand. Once his shotgun was exhausted, he rose to his feet, drew his service revolver, and rushed both Platt and Maddox, single-handedly, killing them both. The incident changed the way law enforcement thinks and equips its officers. Grogan's wife and fellow special agent Sandra Fritch would move on and remarry, and she honorably served the Bureau for 36 years. On September 9th of 2021, Sandra Fritch passed away and was laid to rest beside her first husband, Ben Grogan.
Special Agent Ed Morales wrote a book about the event titled FBI Miami Firefight. I highly recommend it, and I'll leave a link to his book in the description below. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button. There's a lot more mini documentaries in the works and you don't want to miss them. So make sure you're subscribed and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.